Hello class, this is another video reviewing what we learned in chapter 3. So let's uh, recall these mass spring systems and these are like the main application for the differential equations in chapter 3. So this is a setup, we have a spring and it has a weight suspended on it and possibly a damper or a shock absorber. So the point is that we let the weight oscillate on the spring and we want x of t to tell us the position of the weight at time t. And the parameters that we have to work with are m, the mass of the weight, c, the damping or the friction that um, the weight experiences, and k, the spring constant. So typically you will just be given these three values, mass, uh, damping, constant and spring constant. The one thing to note is that sometimes you have to figure out the spring constant for yourself. To find k, you just have to figure out how much force it takes to stretch the spring one meter. And in SI units, you'll be working with force in newtons and distance in meters, um, but every question I'll ask will be in SI units. So. Um, if you can do that, you can figure out the spring constant for yourself, and sometimes you will have to. So the way to model this position function x is just to write m x double prime t plus c x prime of t plus kx t equals zero. And these are all three terms are forces. So you, for instance, you have f equals m a on the first term, and uh, f equals kx Hooke's law in the last term. And this is for unforced systems. So this is for the case when we don't have an external force also acting on the spring. So we can solve this differential equation using the techniques that we have uh, learned previously in the chapter. There are actually several, three, a few cases that we need to divide this uh, system into. There are, three, there, are, there are really two or three possible behaviors that we want to pay attention to. And uh, let's list them. The first case is a case when your system is overdamped, and that means that um, your c squared minus 4km term in your quadratic equation is real. So your general solution is just going to be c1 e of exponential plus c2 times another exponential. And both exponentials are going to be negative because um, m, c, and k are always positive. So what happens is that your x function is just going to die off this way. So c refers to the damping, to friction. So the friction is so high that the spring system doesn't even oscillate. So this is what happens when you have the overdamp system. So you need c squared to be larger than 4km to make the square root real. And the second case of interest is the case when your spring system is underdamped which means that your square root in your quadratic equation, c squared minus 4km, is going to be complex. This happens when the square root, the thing inside the square root is negative, so c squared is less than 4km. And we have a solution that has the form xt equals um, c1 exponential times trig function plus c2 exponential times trig function. So the trig functions give you oscillation, but the exponential functions make the the the, the solution shrink. So you have this little oscillating thing, but that it slowly dies away. This is what you call the underdamped case. And this last case isn't actually in the book, but I think it's a one to keep note of anyway. When you have no friction at all, no damping at all, then your solution is going to be xt c1 cosine plus c2 sine. So if you have no friction at all, there's nothing stopping the spring oscillation from going on forever and ever. And that's what you get. You just get this periodic function that goes on forever. And you notice how like the the size, how big C is, controls the behavior of your system, whether you have an overdamped, underdamped, or undamped system. A few other things to take note of for these uh, unforced cases when you have no external force acting on the spring. So if we want to consider the amplitude of the solution. First, for the undamped case, which is the easier case, we just have xt equals c1 cosine of uh, bt plus c2 sine of bt. And we can just take the c1 and c2 from your solution. And the amplitude is just going to be c1 squared 
plus c2 squared. There, no problem, pretty easy. For the underdamped case, we have to worry about something else. Um, remember that for the underdamped case, your uh, equation is dying off. So your amplitude is going to change as time changes. So we have this extra e minus at term. So we just have to consider that in the amplitude. So the amplitude depends on time. And it's e minus at times what we've had before. So another thing to think about is frequency and period. So let's say we have a, a solution x that has cosine or sine terms in them. So this is, let's just say xt equals cosine omega t for simplicity's sake. To find the period, we have to figure out how long does it take for the function to go through one cycle. And the trig functions always go through one cycle in 2 pi units of time. So we just have to figure out what the time it takes for it to, go to, make, to make it down to 2 pi. And we have that t equals 2 pi over omega is going to be a period, always. And also, that period is also going to be 1 over frequency. So frequency is 1 over period. So frequency is going to be 1 over period. And that's just going to be omega over 2 pi. Now this is called the, I call this the regular frequency. Um, this is the frequency measured in hertz. There are actually two types of frequency. The one that's measured in hertz or uh, cycles per second. But it's also a frequency that's called the angular frequency. And that's going to be measured in radians per second. F equals omega in radians per second. The reason to use the angular frequency instead is that it's easier to read off from the function. So you can see there's an omega in the cosine term. So our angular frequency is omega. So please bear in mind that if you're asked to find the frequency in hertz, which is the, I believe, the SI unit, you have to also divide by 2 pi. 